The votes are in and the UK is out. Welcome to your Friday lunch break. I'm Tanya Rivero. In a historic vote by a margin of 51.9% to 48.1%, the UK has opted to leave the European Union, prompting the resignation of Prime Minister David Cameron and battering the pound more than 11% Thursday night and rocking the global financial markets. The Dow, which started the day down more than 500 points, is currently down about 400 points on the news. The Nasdaq and S&P are also down. Joining us now to discuss the broader financial implications of Brexit are Silvercrest Asset Management Managing Director Patrick Chovanec and WSJ Moneybeat reporter Paul Vigna. Paul, let me start with you. Sure. How much of this sell-off is based simply on the fact that this was unexpected? The markets were well, not expecting uh, You know what it. I would say is a lot of it is based on the fact not even that it was so much unexpected. Because the, 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 the polls were very close all week. What is really happening is that you had you, you had some rumors going through the market that the Remain camp was going to win, whatever whatever the vote was, Remain was going to win. You saw it starkly yesterday. A lot of people placing big bets on Remain winning because they thought they thought they knew something. So what's really happening today is that all those bets are unwinding because they were wrong. Right. They lost. Well, so it wasn't even that they didn't think it could happen. It was just that they... They thought they knew which way it was going to go. But, Patrick, of course, there are still a lot of unknowns, right? We know that David Cameron is leaving office in October. We don't know exactly the date that the U.K. is leaving the EU. So there are still, the market doesn't like that. No, we're going to be living with uh, unknowns and uncertainty for quite a while. Uh, it, there's a two-year process, even if they decide tomorrow to invoke Article 50, which actually begins the process, there's going to be at least a two-year process of trying to disentangle the the United Kingdom from the European Union and that leaves out the question of what happens with Scotland because Scotland uh, clearly wants to stay in the EU more wants more than it wants to stay in the UK so there's a lot of Sure. That we're going to but putting with. all that aside for a moment is the impact of all of this overblown uh, in the US markets for well, the impact on the US markets well I mean, look, the, the immediate reaction is not overblown because it's just a reversal of the, the bets that were wrong. You know? Right. But it's, it's, a, it's a much wider question. The, the direct impact will probably not be so bad, but the indirect impacts, I think, are just, th there's a lot of them and they're going to be hard to predict which way they go because the UK is a trading partner with us. Europe is a trading partner with us. Um, you know, people invest internationally now. Money flows right. all over the place now. So it's really going to be the, the sort of indirect impact of this decision on the global economy, which is already weak. I mean, that's the real issue is that, in my mind, that's the real issue is that you have an, a global economy and a U.S. economy that is not doing particularly well, and now you are adding one more really big game-changing kind of chip on. And how much can the American economy really separate itself from this? Well, what we've seen throughout the year is a market that has been very skittish about big international events that it has a hard time wrapping its mind around. China slowed down the adjustment in oil, now Brexit. Uh, perhaps it'll be the U.S. election by the time this is over. That's not an international event, but but it'll, it's it's some you know these big complex events, and at the same time, interestingly enough, the U.S. economy kind of putters along. Right. Um, the Atlanta Fed's still projecting that the uh, second quarter the U.S. economy will grow by 2.8 percent. So I think we need to weigh those things. And in some ways, I, I, I totally agree with you that the market kind of backed itself into a corner here. They had this they had this remain rally. And now it's being erased by the Brexit bust. But but we're really back where we were a month ago. Now, there were some stocks on the S&P hitting all-time highs this morning. There were stocks that I think were mostly looking at utilities and things that are not so right. exposed to the European market. Do you think those are short-term gains? Yes, but I mean, the, the, the sort of the safety play has been working for, for quite a while because things just don't ever get to this point where they're really better. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, some of the utilities, those things are interesting. But what's also interesting is, is to watch bond yields. Right. Bond yields are, they plummeted overnight. The 10-year came very close to its all-time low. You know, the, the real thing to watch are these sort of safe haven plays, which the utilities, you know, they're, they're right. dovetail I don't think the answer here is simply to be defensive. I think that you need to have a view on what the next few years look like. Well, let's talk about that for a second because money needs a place to go. So where are the buying opportunities that you see here? Well, in the U.S. economy right now, there's a very mixed picture. Mm -hmm. um, there are some sectors that are doing quite well. There are some sectors that are doing quite poorly. 
And I think you have to, instead of being schizophrenic and swinging from everything's great to everything's falling apart, you have to recognize that it is, in fact, a mixed picture and that it requires selectivity and it also requires patience. Um, it, that's, that's really the key here. In the short term, the dollar is going to go up, Paul? It's doing it this morning. It's doing it this morning. <laughs> and how, what do you think the impact will be on the Fed? Well, uh, do I know what the Fed is going to do? Of course not. If, you know, but uh, what people are saying, and I think it's a pretty fair bet, is that uh, look at the situation now. Now you, you're going into the summer months. Uh, you just had a huge global geopolitical event, which is going to take some time to, to iron itself out. We're going to get into the teeth of the election season coming up. A lot of people are saying the Fed is at a point where they're not going to be able to do anything this year on interest rates. I don't think that's an insane bet. And even if they did something, they might do one 25 basis point increase, which is totally nominal. Right. The Fed has been very sensitive. They haven't talked about it, but I think they've been very sensitive about the dollar and the strong dollar being a headwind. Uh, so external weakness plays into that. But I also think that what matters is what happens in the next jobs report. Because uh, if you see a continuing weakening, that's one thing. If you see a rebound, that's a, that's right. a very different picture. Right. And, it, and it brings them more back to the, the old view that they had, which was, yes, there's external weakness, but there's continuing momentum in the US yeah. economy. And, and to that point, the, there are bets in the market this morning that the next move from the Fed will be a cut, not a hike. Interesting. Not that they have a lot of room I to I was going to say. But I mean, that's what, that's what people in the market are starting a, to look at. I think wow. that's a bit premature until wow. we see how the job market does. I want to go abroad for one more second. Do you think that this means that London will no longer be the international financial center that it's been? Will that portend to New York taking some of their business on that uh, level? You should, you should, that's, you should jump on that's that certainly one. the concern in London and why London yeah. voted to remain. Right. Um, right. But uh, I think there's going to be a long process. Uh, look, everybody's talking about Brexit as though it's, it's negative, negative, negative. There's an argument to be made that uh, Brexit in the long term is positive for the UK because then this is 52% of the people agreed with this, that the, the, the EU is bureaucratic and we're becoming more bureaucratic and they didn't want to go down that path. Now, the, the issue though is that the, they ha the gains, the benefits of leaving the EU won't just materialize without a lot of effort. And they also have to mitigate a lot of the negatives. So uh, they have to manage this process to get to reap the potential benefits of Brexit to the extent that they exist. There's a lot to iron out in the days ahead. Patrick, Paul, thanks to both of you for being with us.